wilds of North America, among the trees and rocks and streams, John Muir spent years wandering, learning about nature firsthand. As much as he loved to wander, the Scottish-born conservationist also had a great love of home and family. In 1880, at the age of 42, he married Louis Strensel, a classical pianist and a plant lover like himself. They had two children, Wanda and Helen, and lived on a fruit ranch in Martinez, California. Their family home is now a National Historic Site within the National Park Service. It was from this house that John Muir reached out across the nation to leaders and ordinary citizens alike, inspiring them to protect some of America's most beloved wild places. John Muir was determined to save the wilderness he loved from the onslaught of industrialization sweeping across America. Luckily, he had a great ability to share his vision with others, helping them see wild things as he saw them, beautiful and valuable in and of themselves. I care to live only to entice people to look at nature's loveliness. My own special self is nothing. Early on, John Muir discovered that he could convey his delight in nature to people by writing articles for newspapers and magazines. In the Atlantic Monthly, he wrote, Climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. His articles about wild California struck a chord with the American people, leading to the establishment of Yosemite and Sequoia National Parks. Later, his work played a key role in the creation of Mount Rainier National Park in Washington, and also the incomparable Grand Canyon National Park. John Muir crafted many of his writings at home on the ranch, working upstairs where he could be free from interruption. It was here, in his scribble den, that he took the daring adventures and ruminations of a lifetime and turned them into compelling books and hundreds of influential articles. Everything John wrote, he gave to Louis to critique. Across the hall from the scribble den, Helen and Wanda tiptoed around their bedroom until Papa was done with the project and ready for fun again. Then, accompanied by the family dog, Stikine, he would take them on delightful saunters in the hills close by. Father, Wanda said, was the biggest, jolliest child of us all. The Muirs often opened their home to their many friends and family members. Upstairs, there was a guest room for overnight visitors. John Muir's bedroom was at the front of the house, with plenty of windows onto trees and sky. An even better view could be had by climbing up through the spacious attic into the bell tower at the top of the house. Thanks to John's hard work on the ranch, the Muir family prospered. But ranching took a toll on John Muir, and he often had to go out into the wilds to recover his spirits. I traveled free as a bird, independent alike of roads and people. I entered at once into harmonious relations with nature. With Louis's encouragement, he made a number of trips to Alaska, climbing all over the glaciers that so fascinated him. He also traveled to Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. But it was from his home in California that John Muir laid the foundation for a powerful new conservation movement. In 1892, he and a group of like-minded people formed the Sierra Club. In the room next to the scribble den, once Louis Muir's bedroom, a photo exhibit commemorates John Muir's leading role in the founding of the nation's most influential conservation group. John Muir became increasingly involved in politics, so much so that in 1903, he received a request from Theodore Roosevelt to guide him in Yosemite. Riding horseback and camping alone with the president for three days, John Muir persuaded him to protect vulnerable wilderness areas. 
I stuffed him pretty well regarding the timber thieves and the destructive work of the lumbermen and the other spoilers of the forest. That conversation prompted Roosevelt to set aside millions of acres of forest land and eventually establish the Forest Service. Years later, the National Park Service, another of John Muir's ideas, was created. At Muir's urging, President Roosevelt also saved Yosemite Valley by adding it to the already established Yosemite National Park. But within the park was another wonderful valley that John Muir could not save, no matter how hard he fought. Dam Hetch Hetchy. As well, dam for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches. For no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. But the beautiful Hetch Hetchy Valley was dammed, drowned under hundreds of feet of water. John Muir was exhausted and nearing the end of his life. But from his home on the ranch, he continued to write and spurred thousands of Americans to fight on so that never again would a national park be violated by a dam. John Muir's legacy lives on in the wonderful parks he helped create and the increasing awareness across the nation of the precious gift wild nature is for all of us. He died in 1914 and lies buried next to his wife about a mile from their home. Thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home, that wildness is a necessity, and that mountain parks and reservations are useful not only as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but as fountains of life.